And I want to say that from my own reading, anybody that rejects that science is just, they're, all they're doing is displaying their ignorance of the religion. Because I've never seen any scholar, whether it was Ibn Taymiyyah, even Ibn Abd al-Wahhab, who's the founder of the movement in Nejd that spread over the Arabian Peninsula. Even Ibn Abd al-Wahhab has letters saying that he never denied tasawwuf. You know, that it's a science of Islam. Nobody has ever. Ibn Taymiyyah has an entire volume in his fatawa on tasawwuf. And where, where they differ is what's acceptable within the science. That's where they differ. And this is like medicine. You have medicine. You can't deny that Chinese medicine is a, is a type of medicine. It's a type of medicine. Some Western doctors don't accept certain practices within Chinese medicine. And Chinese doctors likewise don't accept certain things in Western medicine. But they're still, they're, it's, a, it's medicine and it has a system and much of it is empirical. So where this science comes from, there's two central aspects of the science. The first one is akhlaq. And it's, it's getting your character aligned with the character of the Prophet ﷺ. That's at the center of this teaching. It's trying to align your character with the character of the Prophet ﷺ so that you actually follow his sunnah. I and mean, one of the things that a lot of people do, they follow the sunnah of the beard, the siwak, the robe. They take all these outward sunnah, but then they don't follow the sunnah of smiling. Like they'll never smile. Now, the beard is an important sunnah, there's no doubt about that. But anybody can grow a beard. Do you know, it's, it's, it's an effortless practice. You just don't shave. <laughs> Seriously, it's effortless. But smiling, when you don't feel like smiling, you know, that, it takes effort to do that. And that's why it's one of his amazing sunnahs is that he was constantly smiling. al dahak that's one of his names, the one who smiled. And he always smiled when he saw people, you know. He, he, he greeted them with a smile. So, so that's one aspect. Now, the other aspect of the science is when you begin to inculcate prophetic qualities and practices, especially when you begin to do the devotional w ones. Because the Prophet can Allah fi kulli ahyani. He used to mention Allah like Aisha says in Sahih al-Bukhari. He remembered Allah in all of his states. So he did constant dhikr of Allah. If you begin to do those types of practices, certain things begin to happen. And that is what they call the ahwal, states. And states are real. People go into states. Now, s there are different types of states. There are psychotic states. There are people that go into spiritual psychoses where they do a lot of dhikr and they literally lose it. And I've seen this personally. I know that it's real. A and you find it in other religions as well where people, and I've seen people, I knew somebody who did dhikr all the time. And I used, you know, and, and it wasn't healthy. And they ended up thinking that they were a prophet. You know, that happens to people. You know, it's a, it's a type of spiritual psychosis. So you have to have balance. It's very important to have balance. And that's part of the Prophet ﷺ's teaching, is teaching people balance, how to maintain balance in your life. Like he said, that one of the Sahaba, he was doing dhikr all the time and fasting. He never spent any time with his wife. His wife went and complained to the Prophet. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, he said, no, your wife has rights over you. He said, I, I spend time with my family. That that's also sunnah, to be with your family. To be, there's a sunnah for um, sitting and enjoying yourself with your family. Um, that they had a food fight in, recorded in our tradition inside the house. They were throwing food at each other. And the Prophet was watching it and he was laughing. You know, I mean, that's in the sunnah. That's a, that's, a frivolous thing, but we know that recreation and frivolity is actually n necessary for a healthy 
person that if you don't do those things, you, you get sick. So it's, it's, it's not frivolous in that it, there is a purpose for it. Even frivolity has a purpose. What is problematic when that becomes your life, you know, when, when that's all your life is, is a search for fun and frivolity and things like that. Now, it's a science in that it's replicable. I mean, the definition of true science is falsifiability, according to Karl Popper. And, and falsifiability means that if, if you can't falsify something, then it's not science. It's philosophy or metaphysics or something else. Falsifiability enables you to, if you say that the sound barrier is broken at a certain speed, and every time you get to that speed, you hear the sound barrier broken, you can falsify that theory. You can test it. So if it doesn't happen the same way every time, then it's, it's obviously not, the theory's not sound. So, or freezing ice at zero Celsius. You know, water freezes at zero Celsius. If you keep testing that with calibrated instruments that are effective, and every single time it freezes at zero, you've falsified something, you've tested it, and shown that, indeed, you get the same replication of the, you, know, you can replicate that experiment. And the same is true for these inner sciences, is that people, when they do certain things, they get the same experiences. And that's why these books are very interesting, because there are books written in, in Sri Lanka, in Harat, in Turkey, in Morocco, by different scholars, and they're describing the same things because the same things happen to people in different times and places. And in that way, it's replicable. So the ahwal, that's a separate science. That's a separate science. And that's really not, th this is more about akhlaq and about behavior. So th those are the two branches of this science, is the science of the states and stations, of the things that happen to people in those, and then trying to inculcate these qualities in oneself, which is what this book is about. So he's going to talk from the Qur'an about the maqam al-shukr, the station of gratitude and praise, al-shukr wa hamd the maqam of taqwa, the station of, of taqwa, and, and then there's degrees in that of taqwa and shukr. Maqam al-dhikr, the station of dhikr. Maqam al-sabr, the station of patience. Maqam al-tawheed. Maqam al-mahabba, the station of love. Maqam al-tawakkul, the station of trust. Maqam al-muraqaba, which is the station of vigilance, of awareness of the divine presence. Maqam al-khawf, the station of fear, the state of awe. Maqam al-raja, state of hope, maqam at tawbah and then maqam at ikhlas which is really, that's at the root. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, in, in his qawaid, he said there's over 2,000 definitions of tasawwuf. But he said all of them revolve around sidq at sincerity. That that's, that's really at the root. So he says, إِنَّ تَصَوَّفَ شَيْءٌ يَقْذِفُهُ وَاللَّهُ فِي قُلُوبِ أَسْفِيَائِهِ Tasawwuf is something that God thrusts into the hearts of those people of purity. وَهُوَ يُذَاقُ عَلَى يَدِّ أَهْلِهِ And it's something that must be tasted at the hands of its people. So what he's saying, and this is Imam al-Ghazali who precedes him and is really one of the great formulators of this science. Imam al-Ghazali says that tasawwuf is really about dhawq, which is tasting. And the reason they use that metaphor for this science is because there are certain things that you cannot explain to other people. They have to be tasted. And Imam al-Ghazali uses honey as his metaphor. He said, if somebody asks you what honey tastes like, the best way to help him understand is to give him a spoonful of honey. You can say it's sweet, but it's not like sugar. It's not like fruit. It's, it's a distinct thing. 
And even though honeys are very different, there's something that all honeys share in common that we place them into the, the genus or the, the genus of honey. There's different types of honey, but there's one genus. And so that's what he's saying, that this is something about tasting. And that's why the best way to taste this is to be in the company of its people because you will experience it from them. You, it's not something that you can really get from a book. A book can help you. It's like a map, but in the end you have to take the journey. The map's a waste of time. Borges, the Argentinian writer, has a story about a Chinese emperor that wants an exact map of China. And so every map they bring him, it's completely inadequate. So finally he decides to lay paper across all of China. <laughs> so it's an exaggeration about the nature of maps. They're limited. They're always limited. You have to take the journey. That's the only way you're going to understand the terrain. You can read about desert, but you have to experience it. You have to see it. You can read about a maha, but once you see a maha, you'll understand why the Arabs, you know, I mean, you read Maha, it's a, a woman's name. Why would they name a woman after a wild oryx? Oryx is a type of gazelle. Yeah, yeah, oryx is a type, it's a specific type. That's okay. But why they would name after the animal, you have to see it. And once you see it, oh, now I understand. It makes perfect sense. And that's experience. That's the difference of experience and a kind of book knowledge. The Arabs say every thing has a portion of its name. Like whenever you, you know, whatever you give a child. Yeah, that's why the Prophet said, choose good names for your children, because they'll get a portion of the name. And that's the nature of what name, the power of names. That's why the Prophet always changed bad names, negative names. So then he says, وَأَصْرُهُ نِعْمَ الصَّفَا وَالْوَفَا وَالْمَحَبَّةَ الصَّادِقَةَ مَحَلَّ الْقُرْبِ بِالْمُصْطَفَى Its foundation is the blessing of purity and loyalty, of fulfilling your oath and promise. And true love, that is, and its place is in nearness to the Prophet So that's really what this is about. It's about those things that he described. وَأَمَّا تصوف فَرَهُ تَعَلَّقٌ بِالْقُرْآنِ As for tasawwuf, it has a connection with the Qur'an. In other words, this is a Qur'anic science. And that's why what's interesting about this book and why I really like it, is he took it entirely from the Qur'an. Because there's people that claim tasawwuf is something outside of Islam. They borrowed it from the Hindus, they borrowed it from the Buddhists, they borrowed it. And there's some truth to those elements. There's definitely within some of the turuq uh, of the Sufiya, they, they borrow things from other traditions. That, that's just fact. But the science is a Quranic science. And, and that's, that's why he wrote this book, to really show that. لَمَّا وَرَدَ فِي الْقُرَانِ مِنَ الْمَعَارِفَ الْإِلَهِيَّةِ وَرِيَاضَةَ النُّفُوسِ وَتَنْوِيرَ الْقُلُوبِ وَتَطْهِيرِهَا بِاكْتِسَابِ الْأَخْلَاقِ الْحَمِيدَةِ وَاشْتِنَابِ الْأَخْلَاقِ الْذَمِيمَةِ Because we see that in the Qur'an, many divine knowledges have come, and also the disciplining of the souls, the illumination of the hearts, the purification of the hearts, by acquiring virtuous character, and by avoiding vice. So this, وَقَدْ تَكَلَّمَتَ الْمُتَصَوِّفَةُ فِي تَفْسِيرِ Quran And the Sufis spoke and interpreted the Qur'an themselves. So they spoke about tafsir al-Qur'an. Yeah, that goes under the same type thing. Generally, the majority of scholars say you can. There are some scholars that say it's a bid'ah. But, yeah, the majority say you can. Yeah, but there, there's a valid opinion about dhikr, group dhikr, where people actually uh, say dhikr together. Some say it's makru, some say it's prohibited, but those are very weak opinions. They really are. But when they're there, so they shouldn't be just rejected. Oh, that's rubbish. No, those are a valid opinions of valid scholars. But the, the majority of scholars say it is permissible to gather to do dhikr. 
Atta ibn Rabah said, he was asked about the hilq al-dhikr, the gatherings of dhikr, and he said, uh, there are the circles of halal and haram, in other words, learning fiqh, that's the real circles of dhikr. But that, and that's true, that, that's, if you haven't learned that, you shouldn't be doing dhikr, because that's a fart ayn to learn that, so you should learn, it's important to learn. But there are many hadiths about people gathering, reciting the Qur'an together, gathering, saying la ilaha illallah together. There are many, there are many sound hadiths. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, yeah, they just shouldn't be in the same circle. You know, if, 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 if there's, you know, if, the, if they're not distracted by one another. And, I mean, this, you know, we're, we're together, we're mingling and things like that. You know, these things are just out of adab for... The way I was taught, you know, um, people here, we're living in the West, we're in very different circumstances um, than cultures that are isolated. And not all Muslim cultures are isolated. I mean, some cultures have a segregation between the sexes, others don't. In most historical Muslim countries, there was a lot of adab about this and, uh, you know, a lot of reasons for that. In the West, we tend to uh, intermix a lot and people should still have adab and things like that. You know, I mean, most of you have studied in university. You've studied sitting next to men and women. You know, I mean, we've all done that, and it didn't destroy us. We didn't turn into, you know, crazy people or something like that. But it's it's just at a people. The Prophet ﷺ was on Hajj, and uh, one of his relatives, a woman, came up. She was very beautiful, and the, in the Hajj you don't, and 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 and. Uh, Abbas's cousin was like just staring at him. He's on Hajj and he's in front of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, he just, she was very beautiful. And that's what the hadith said. She had a beautiful face. So the Prophet took his head and turned it the other way. <laughs> so then he says, the benefit of the dhikr of all of these names and attributes, all of these benefits are in dhikr al fard It's in the single dhikr. And that's saying Allah, Allah, Allah. And that is the extreme, that is the furthest purpose or end. And it's where everything arrives to. So, and that's not something to do that consistently, you, you do need help. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage anybody to do that. The, the best thing is to focus on your prayer in its time, to, to do the dhikrs, the, especially the du'as the Prophet gave us to do every morning and evening, those type things. That's the most important thing, be consistent in those. For people that are really serious and are getting up at night and doing things, then you need some help, gain some help from somebody who has authority in that area, and that's true. The dhikr al far there's a debate about it. I was actually surprised to find this in the book because of Ibn Juzay. But it's definitely the Shadri, Abu Hassan, Ibn Atayullah, they're from that school. Not all the schools do that, doing Allah, 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 doing the dhikr al far There's good hadith. The Prophet said the end of time won't come until people stop saying Allah, Allah, Allah. So, mm -hmm. I'm talking about, you know, this is a science. It's an experimental science, and just like any experimental science, you do things, things happen. You get, it's like chemistry. You put this chemical in with this one, you get a reaction. Some of those reactions in chemistry are dangerous. When you get a chemistry kit for children, there's warnings, right? Certain things are done in the supervision of an adult. Well, it's like that with Vicka. There's certain things that you need the supervision of somebody that knows the effect. There's people that do names and they go crazy. And I've seen this, so I'm, I'm talking from experience. I have seen, there's something called spiritual psychosis. It's real and it happens to people. There are people that do too much dhikr and they start getting psychotic. And that's why certain dhikrs are, are cold, they're cool, like, like prayer on the Prophet is a very cooling dhikr. It, it subdues the self. And there are other dhikrs that heat it up and, and they, they start burning things up and people can't take it. And then people are different. Some people are very balanced by nature. Other people are very volatile. So the vicars they do should be appropriate to the type personality or character that they have. And I would generally say, 
Dhikr is medicine. Allah describes it as shifa, right? The Quran is a shifa. There are over-the-counter drugs, and then there are drugs that you need a doctor for. All right? As simple as that. You have over-the-counter drugs. Most of what the Prophet gave us is over-the-counter. But when you start getting into numbers and uh, specific, like doing specific names, you need people that know what they're doing with that. Because it's, it's... it's just not appropriate for people to be doing certain things. So, you know, with caution. Now, I want to finish this because we're done now. Which means they're completely absent from creation. It's as if they don't even see themselves. Yafna an nafsihi. Wa an Even that the self is witnessing the unity of God. They don't see that. And that's where you get some of the Sufis have outrageous statements that are unacceptable by Sharia. But they were said in these states of witnessing. Many famous statements. There's a, there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ said, a man loses his camel in the desert. God is more happy with the, the tawbah of a servant than the one of you when he loses his camel in the desert and then he finds his camel. And he's so happy he shouts, Oh Allah, you're my slave and I'm your Lord. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, أَخْطَأَ مِنْ شِدَّةِ فَرَحِهِ He made a mistake in what he said because he was so filled with excessive joy. That's in Sahih al-Bukhari. And that's the basis of what's called a shatha, which is an outrageous statement that we reject. But it's said under extreme uh, state of joy or witnessing. So there's people that say, glory to me. They don't mean that. They're lost to themselves. Well, there's no God except me. They don't mean that. It's this extreme state of ecstasy. Because in the end, the slave is the slave and the Lord is the Lord. And we adhere to that. And we don't believe in pantheism, in panentheism. God is not everything. We don't believe that this is God. This is God. We don't believe that. It's not like Hinduism or... We don't believe in any of that. We believe that Allah has a creation. The creation is contingent upon Him. But we also believe that ultimately the only ultimate reality, independent of all things, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is dependent upon Him, and, and contingent reality has no intrinsic reality. It's only real based upon the fact that the one sustaining it is real. And so this is a very fine point of Tawheed that often the people of this science are attacked because people don't understand the sophistication of the thought, which is another problem. And he says, this is what some of the Sufis call fana. Fana is found in the Quran. It's used, the word yafna. You know, everything goes into annihilation except God. So there is an idea of fana in the Quran. But it's a word that's used. It may have been taken from Buddhism. It's, it's possible. I, some of these people that introduced these mustarahat were from areas where Buddhism had been. Because the Buddhism, they used the, almost the identical term in their tradition, Nibbana. So uh, it might have been taken a lot on them, but it has a basis in the Quran. It's also not far-fetched that different traditions in their spiritual or internal practices arrive at very similar experiences. And the expressions of those experiences tend to be very similar. So that's also possible. People tend to attack Tasawwuf as being derived out of previous traditions. But it's not true. And that's what he's really trying to show here, is that this all has a basis in the Quran. And it shouldn't be surprised that the previous traditions and our tradition have a lot of similarities, because we believe that these great world religions are from God. So it's not surprising there would be similarities in them at all. And then also he says they lose sight of their tawheed. Now this is dangerous, which is why in the dua of Ibn Mashis he says, one shouldn't even know how to tawheed, protect me from the dangers of tawheed. Now Aisha Radilano, when she was given the bara'a from God, God declared her innocent in the Quran, her father and mother told her to go thank the Prophet. What did she say? I only thank God. She was, wit she was in a state of witnessing. She didn't see the Prophet. She didn't see the Sabbath. 
She was only seeing the musabbib. And that's a type of state that people go into because Allah had declared her innocent. It wasn't anger or petulance or she was being childish or no. She was literally, she said, Kuntu ahkiru nafsi. I used to consider myself so insignificant, God would never make mention of me. Who am I for God? I mean, see, she had a total self negation. So when she was accused of adultery, she thought, God is not going to say anything about this. She didn't think it'd be mentioned in the Quran. She thought maybe the Prophet would be told something, but she just said, I deem myself too insignificant. But she wasn't too insignificant. God mentions her, uh, not by name specifically, but by the incident. And then he says, that is because of this immense istiqraq, this drowning, this state of complete immersion in the witnessing. And that's why they said about the Prophet Ahzan, he was always depressed. That's, that's in the Shema'il. And then in another riwayah, he was always happy. The ulama say that when he was with people, he was very sweet and smiled a lot and was very interactive with people. But if you saw him when he was in a state of dhikr, you would think he was depressed. But it wasn't depression. It was, it was, he was in such a deep state of contemplation that he was absent to his surroundings and the world. So people would look at him. But the Prophet did not have grief like that. How necessarily important is it to commit to one shaykh to develop your spirituality, inshallah, be uh, elevated? I mean, I would say that yeah, you'll get different opinions depending on who you ask. Um, there's a nice translation of Ibn Abad's letter on whether it's obligatory to take a shaykh. There's a saying, and I think personally it's not a hadith, but it's a sound saying. Whoever doesn't have a shaykh, shaytan's a shaykh. But that generally, uh, first and foremost, it means that you have to have a teacher of sharia. You have to have somebody that teaches you the religion. When we visited Sheikh Nimr the other day for some of the men that were here, what did he keep saying? Get teachers, even if you have to pay them have teachers, you need teachers to guide you, you need to have sources of knowledge, um, those things. In terms of spiritual advancement, they're, they're definitely, if people are having spiritual experiences and things like that, it's good to have people that, that know what they're doing. Sahba is also good. Many of the shiuch of this period, like Sheikh Ahmed Mashur al Haddad, who I studied with, Dr. Omar studied with, Sidi Abdul Hakim Winter studied with, he was of the opinion that the idea of taslim was over. You know, surrendering yourself to a sheikh completely, this wasn't its time. And um, there, there's a lot of dysfunctional aspects in a lot of relationships that happen. So th there, there are problems within all these systems. And uh, Surrendering your sovereignty, you have to be very careful about that, who you're going to give your sovereignty to. Some people demand a lot. You know, there's a poem by Robert Frost. Uh, they say the truth will make you free. My truth will make you slave to me. <laughs> so you, you just have to be careful. There's a lot of manipulation out there. People from Pakistan know very well about the Pir Sabs and what happens in that season. I'm not making it up, am I? I mean, a lot of these people, they're just flat out charlatans. They're charlatans all over West Africa. You know, Sufi sheikhs and, uh, you know, come and be a murid. And, and then they have a lot of, the danger of Sufism that bothers me about it is there's a lot of principles in Tasawwuf that are very easily manipulated uh, into certain cultic control mechanisms and, and they become very dangerous. I think for uh, those of us in the West, we come from a tradition of in, in individual sovereignty and independence uh, of self. And I personally believe those are very high Islamic characteristics and qualities. I think a lot of the problem in the East is all this slavishness and devotion and obsequiousness to, you know, the Grand Master, Poobah, whoever. I mean, if, if you want my personal opinion, I, I do believe that. That does not mean that I don't show the utmost respect to my teachers. I do. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bey is my teacher, and, you know, I would be very hesitant to ever 
But what I love about him is he's somebody that respects my opinion, listens to my opinion. He's never been despotic in any way. Habib Ahmed Mashhur al-Haddad was not despotic at all. He didn't get angry at people. He didn't abuse people. Those are the teachers that I had. Si Fadul al-Hawari was like that. And so you just have to look to, to people, observe them. I would be really careful. That's all. You have to be very careful. There's a lot of people. And then there's some people that are not charlatans. They're just, they're either deluded or they're trying to keep something alive that's important to keep alive. And they have their own limitations. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said that, that there weren't, weren't any complete teachers by his time. He's ninth century. So he already said that the completed masters were gone. And he said, so just find people that, uh, you know, could do the best that they could and recognize their shortcomings and don't, uh, don't have greater expectations than they can do that. So that's what I would say. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Allah knows best. It's in Sahih Muslim, so it's a, it's a sound hadith. So I am with my servant when he remembers me. And if he remembers me in his own self, I remember him in mine. And if he remembers me in a group, I remember him in a group better than the group he remembers me. So, and then he says there are three types of dhikr. Dhikr with the heart, dhikr with the tongue, and the two together. So he says, know that dhikr is the best of all actions. If you took all of our actions, dhikr is the best of all actions. Even though there are some hadiths that have been related that say that other things are better, like prayer in its time, which is dhikr, and things like that. And that is because they contain the meaning of remembrance and presence with God. And the proof for the benefit, the, 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 the proof that dhikr is the most virtuous thing is from three aspects. The first, الأول, النصوص الواردة بتفضيله على سائر الأعمال. The many texts that have been related that prefer it over all other actions. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم ألا أنبئكم بخير أعمالكم وأزكاها عند مريككم وأرفعها في درجاتكم وخير لكم من انفاق الذهب والفضة في سبيل الله وخيرا لكم من أن تلقوا عدوكم فتضربوا أعناقهم ويضربوا أعناقكم قالوا بلا يا رسول الله قال ذكر الله وسئر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أي العمار أفضل قال ذكر الله قيل له الذكر أفضل أم الجهاد في سبيل الله فقال لو ضرب المجاهد بسيفه في الكافر حتى ينقضع سيفه ينقطع سيفه ويختضب دما لكان الذاكر أفضل منه. So the first reason is all of these hadiths that have been related that prefer it over other things. The Prophet ﷺ said in a sound hadith, it's related as a balagh, it's from Abu Darda, the hadith. Uh, it's related in the Muwatta, it's Mawquf, which means Abu Darda doesn't say he heard it from the Prophet, but generally Mawquf of Muwatta is from the Prophet ﷺ. It's Marfu'ah in other texts, so Imam Tirmidhi relates it and others. Should, can I not tell you the best of all your actions and the purest of it with your king, your sovereign, and the highest in degrees, and, the be and better for you than spending your wealth, your gold and silver in the way of God, and better for you uh, than meeting the enemy on battle and striking him and him striking you, or striking his neck, uh, their necks, and, and them striking your necks. And they said, indeed, tell us, Ya Rasulullah. And he said, Dhikrullah, remembrance of God. And once the Prophet ﷺ was asked, which are the best of actions? And he said, remembrance of God, Dhikrullah. And then it was said to him, is Dhikr better than Jihad? Is dhikr better than jihad? Remember, it's better than jihad. Fisabilidah, in the way of God. And he said, even if the mujahid was striking his sword in uh, the kafir until his sword broke and he was covered in blood, the one remembering God would be better than him. 
Now, the ulama say the reason for that, and that's related by At-Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah, uh, Ibn Majah. Um, the reason that dhikr is better is because dhikr is an end in and of itself. It's not a means. That we were created for the purpose of remembering God. Jihad is a means. A means is always over an end. It's always higher. And some of the ulama say that jihad is better when jihad is necessary. Like to defend the land, is, you don't sit in the masjid, no, I'm doing dhikr, it's better than the mujahid out there. Do you see? No. You go out and you defend the land, and that's the best. And then he's also stressing the fact that dhikr in your actions, if your actions are devoid of dhikr, then they're not uh, beneficial actions. So if you're out in jihad, struggling in the way of God, um, then you should be doing dhikr as well. And the Prophet told them to do dhikr, the mujahidun. And so difficult now we talk about jihad and in the environment we're in. It's very sad. But jihad is a very high thing. And our religion is a religion of struggle. It's as simple as that. I mean, somebody said to me, do the Muslims really want to take over the world? I said, no, they're just reacting violently to the fact that we're taking over the world. <laughs> just so strange. You know, America, they want to take over the world. But meanwhile, we're taking over the world. 143 bases around the planet. Really? It's amazing. So, anyway, no politics. الثاني أن الله تعالى حيثما ذكر الذكر وأمر بالذكر أثنى على الذاكرين واشترط فيه الكثرة وقال اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا ولم يشترط ذلك في سائر الأعمال الثالث أن في الذكر المزية هي له خاصية ليس لغيره وهي الحضور في الحضرة العلية والوصول إلى القرب الذي عبر عنها ما ورد من المجالسة والمعية فإن الله تعالى يقول أنا جريس من ذكرني ويقول أنا عند الظن عبدي بي وأنا معه إذا ذكرني So the second is that whenever God mentions dhikr in the Quran or commands people to dhikr not only does he praise the ذاكرين but he also places the condition of doing much remembrance of it So he says أذكر الله remember Allah ذكرا كثيرا abundantly So do much remembrance of God and he never says that in any of, uh, of the other actions he commands us to do. So when he says fast, he doesn't say fast a lot. He doesn't say do jihad a lot. He doesn't say, but when it comes to dhikr, he always says do much dhikr. So if it wasn't the best of actions, there would be no need to emphasize the importance of doing much of it. And then he says also dhikr has a certain quality that is specific to it. And it's, doesn't, there's no other thing that has this quality. And that is the presence of the highest, the hadra al-aliyya, the highest divine presence. So, and also arrival to nearness to this divine presence that has been articulated in what has come down to us in these texts about being in the company, sitting with, and also being in the company. So Allah says, for instance, Allah the Exalted says, Ana jalisu man dhakarani. I am the companion of the one remembering me. I mean, jalis literally means I'm sitting with. All right, but we don't take that literally. I'm the companion of the one. In other words, I'm with, I'm in that gathering. And also in the hadith that was previously related, I am in the opinion of my servant, whatever my servant thinks, if he remembers me, I'm with him when he remembers me. So the ma'iyah of Allah and the hadra and the presence of God. Now this is where it gets very interesting. What in nasif al maqsad bi dhikri maqaman. Fa maqsad al ammati iktisab al ujur wa maqsad al khasati al qurb wa al hudur. وبين المقامين فرق بعيد فكم بين من يأخذ أجره وهو من وراء الحجاب وبين من يقرب حتى يكون من خواص الأحباب هيهاتا 
واعلم ان الذكر على انواع كثيره منها التهليل والتسبيح والتكبير والحمدله والحوقله والحسبله وذكر كل اسم من اسماء الله تعالى والصلاه على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم والاستغفار وغير ذلك ولكل ذكر خاصيه وثمره وبالله التوفيق الى منهج التحقيق وحسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل. So amongst the people there are many different reasons, ends, or purposes for doing dhikr. Uh, in other words, sorry, amongst the, the people the, uh, and their purposes for doing dhikr, there are two stations. The, the purpose of common people is to gain rewards. They want rewards. The, you know, like if you go in, in Jama'at Tabligh, they tell you if you do this, you get this. If you do this, you get this. If you do this, uh, if you do this prayer, you get 100. And you can get your calculator out, start adding it up because there, there's rewards. And they're in the hadith and they're mentioned. He's saying that that is the, the, the more general people. They want these rewards. But the end or the purpose of dhikr for the, the uh, people of distinction, the khasa, is nearness and presence. They want to be near God and feel his presence. And he's saying, what a great difference between these two. And what a difference between the one who takes his reward from behind a veil. So you get the reward from behind a veil. And between the one who draws near until he's from amongst the beloved. So, and then he says, hey hata or hey hatu, hey hat. Uh, hey hat is an Arabic expression, you know, how far off the mark. Hey hata. You know, and then he says, know that dhikr has many different types. There's tahleel. Saying La ilaha illallah. You know, hallelu in English they say hallelujah. That's where that comes from. Hallelu. Really? I'm not making that up. It's in actually Noah Webster's dictionary from 1832. He actually takes it back to Arabic and says it's from the Arabic hallelu, which is to shout for joy. It's like in like, you know, a Christian, hallelujah. You know, it's a shout for joy. Hallelu. 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 You know, say La ilaha illallah. <laughs> That's what it means. I'm not making that up. You know. <laughs> they just don't know it. We have to teach them. Yeah, so, so uh, and then tasbih saying subhanallah, takbir saying Allahu Akbar, hamdulillah saying alhamdulillah, hawqala saying la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, hasbullah saying hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. Every, and then all the various dhikrs of the names from the names of God. And then finally, the prayer on the Prophet ﷺ. So you have all the dhikrs of, the, of Allah, and each one of them is different. And then you have the dhikr, the remembrance of the Prophet, and prayer on the Prophet. And istighfar, asking forgiveness. And those last two, he says for last, because they're the most important ones towards the end of time. That's why the istighfar and salah ala nabi are very important in our time. And then there are other things as well. And he says every dhikr has a property and a fruit. So dhikr is like a seed and you're watering and the result, there's a fruit that comes from it. And, and with Allah's tawfiq to this path of, of realization and he's enough for us and the best of protectors. Bab maqam thamaratir adkar, the section on the station of the fruits of dhikr. So now he's going to tell us what these dhikrs do for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. It, um, let me finish the sections, and if, if I haven't answered the question, because I'm going to answer that question in the section. So if I haven't answered the question in the section, then you can ask the question. Um, but so sometimes the 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 question that you have, it's going to come. Because if you have the question, usually the mu'allif has already thought of generally, or the one who's giving the commentary on it. Because it's, it's a very valid question, it's related to the topic. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, those are the best kind for during this, yeah. They have the means and the end. Yeah, so it's very high. Yeah. No, there's things that about the mujahid that are related that are amazing. So jihad should never be belittled in any way, shape, or form. But, but, but a lot of people, what's important to note 
is when people, there's a lot of people that think that Islam is just about one type of jihad. And, and so it becomes military and that's all they can think about. Military is, that's a certain type of, even the Prophet ﷺ, not all of the Sahaba were of that nature. Most of them were because the Arabs are military people. I mean, when the Ansar came to the Prophet to Tuba'ah, they said, نَحْنُ أَهْلَ الْحَرْبِ أَبْنَعُ حَرْبًا وَشَوْكَ You know, we're, we're the sons of war because their environment was a belligerent environment. Now, when you're in civilized societies, and theirs was not civilized by the standards that, that we understand today. There was vengeance, there was blood writ, there was... Uh, uh, you know, if somebody killed your cousin, you went out and killed anybody from his family. That's how their culture was. If you're in a, in a country like England, for instance, um, most people are not belligerent. I mean, they might get drunk at the pub and become belligerent. But generally, when you're dealing with people, they're not belligerent. And if you have altercations, they'll solve them in ways that aren't violent. It doesn't mean there aren't violent people amongst them. There are. But the society's norm is not violence. The society's norm is civil. And that's called civil society. And the healthier a society is, the more civil it is. So when you have civil societies and you're focusing always on militaristic qualities and characteristics, something's very seriously wrong. But when you're in an environment under siege, then that emphasis is very important. So the, the Muslims have to recognize emphasis. Like right now, the most important thing is education. Imam al-Ghazali didn't fight jihad. Even though during his lifetime, the Palestine was under occupation. But he thought it's a waste of time to try to free Palestine if you've got a bunch of barbarians that are freeing it. Because they'll just end up killing all the Christians and, and it'll be, make Islam look bad. So his focus was on educating the Muslims. And that's why the school system that was laid out during his time produced Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. His generation was produced by Imam al-Ghazali, Sidi Abdul Qadir Jilani. There's no Salahuddin al-Ayyubi without that groundwork that was laid by these intellectual scholars who were re-educating the Ummah to the true principles of Islam. And there are many people who have criticized Imam al-Ghazali and said, why isn't there a Bab al-Jihad in his Ihya? Why didn't he write that, that? The whole book, that's the whole point. That whole book, what predicates uh, any type of, of uh, martial endeavor, you have to have spiritual people. And that's why the Sahaba weren't allowed to fight for, for 13, more than that, 14 and a half years. They weren't allowed to fight. It was all purification. They were being prepared because you don't want people that are vengeful and violent. You don't want those people fighting because they're just going to, they won't care about people. Even some of the ulama said the only reason that war was the only repository for slaves, all other forms of slavery were abolished in Islam. Before Islam, you were born a slave, you indentured servitude, you know, if you got into debt, you became a slave, you could be just captured, kidnapped, or a lot of different ways. Like now, there's, they have all these types of slavery out there. But Islam only allowed slavery from war. That's the last. And so, some of them said the whole point was because when people are fighting and they think that they're going to be slaves, they don't want to kill the people. They actually want them to live. So it's actually a, a mercy for the people that you're fighting. Because, it, you know, what a waste. We'll get to that. But, um, I mean, generally, our opinion. I mean, when I say our, I'm not putting myself with the ulama, trust me. I mean, our opinion, our opinion for people of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah, and the dominant configuration of that, uh, because there are people, there are minority opinions within the Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah, but the dominant opinion, the opinion that I was taught, the opinion of my teachers, is that, um, you know, Tawassal is permitted, uh, to ask the Prophet Sallallahu for intercession is permitted, like that. That's that's what I was taught, and that's that's what I believe, and that's that's. Um, I think that is the strongest opinion. So let's go to the jahi, the inna jahi, and Allah alim, the weak hadith, but it's related. I mean, it's not fabricated hadith. 
And the, and the hadith of Uthman ibn Hunayf is the strongest one because that's a sahih hadith without any debate. And even Taymiyyah's interpretation of it is, goes against all the other ulama. So with all due respect to Ibn Taymiyyah, the ulama just rejected that rejection of that hadith. So the hadith of Uthman ibn Hunayf is, is uh, a sound hadith and he, the Prophet taught him how to make the dua, tashri'an. He could have made the, the shafa'a right there because he asked him to intercede for me. But he told him, go do wudu, and he thinks you will do, pray the rakat, and then pray this prayer. Allahumma inni as'aruka, bi nabiyika, Muhammad. I ask you through your prophet Muhammad. And then he said, say, ya Muhammad. And then he said to say that in his dua, ya Muhammad, inni atashafa'u ilayka. I'm asking your shafa'a, your intercession to my Lord. Allahumma shafa'u fiya wa shafa'ni fi nafsi. Oh Allah, make him my intercessor with you and make me an intercessor also. In other words, make me worthy of interceding for others. That, that dua is sound dua. It's pretty clear. Well, they have, yeah, it's a weak opinion, the other opinion. That, that's a 7th century innovation. Before the 7th century, nobody said that. But to, that, to intercede with the Prophet's not acceptable. That's a 7th century opinion. Before that, none of the Salaf said that. None of them. There's no, nobody can find any word. And it's, to ask them to prove that, show some opinion before Ibn Taymiyyah that, that counters that. There's none. And that's the opinion of, you know, they have the, all these great ulama. I mean, they all have it in their books. And so it's very strange, but it's become a dominant opinion because of the, the, the books and all the money that has enabled uh, the madhab to spread like that. But it's not the dominant opinion of the, the scholars of Islam by any standard. So it's a khidaf. They don't accept our khidaf, we accept their khidaf. What can I say? You know, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. It's jaiz, it's not wajib. It's, it's just permissive. When I asked Murat Farhad, my own teacher, about it, he said jaiz. <laughs> you want to do it, fine. You don't want to do it, fine. Just don't tell people you can't do it. If they want to do it. Don't tell people you can't do it because you don't have any proof. And the proofs that they use have been refuted very profoundly by the scholars. I mean, it's not saying that they used to call on stones. And those stones, they did it to draw near to Allah. And then they said, who worships the Prophet? I don't worship the Prophet. And to say that, well, you're asking him to ask God. Well, I asked Sidi Abdul Hadi to ask God. Abdul Hadi, make dua for me, please. Jazakallah khairan. You need to make dua. What, is that shirk? So you say, well, the Prophet's dead. Not in my belief. That's your belief, that's fine. In my belief, he's hayyun fi qadrihi. In my belief, if I say, salamu alaykum, in the sahih hadith, an angel tells him, Hamza Yusuf just said, Salaam alaikum ya Rasulullah, and he says to me, Hamza Yusuf, wa alaikum as -salam. What is wa alaikum as -salam if it's not dua? It's a dua, peace be upon you. So we know the Prophet makes dua for us. So I, if I want to ask you to make dua for me, that's fine. Don't tell me it's shirk. I don't worship the Prophet. You know, I can take penicillin. I don't have to just sit and, and die of some infectious disease because it's shirk, brother. God's the shafi. <laughs> just go straight to God. Why are you going to penicillin? <laughs> because God put needs in the world to, to, to get his blessing. Healing is a blessing, but if he made penicillin a means to that blessing, so be it. And if he made the public life a means to that blessing, then how did he do that?
Yeah, but those are actions. Those are things. People forget that tawassal is a fiqh question. It's not an aqida question. It's not a belief. It's an action. That's why it's dealt with in hajj. It's dealt with in bab al-hajj. It's not dealt with in the books of aqida. It's actually dealt with in the books of fiqh. It's just some people have turned it into an aqida question. But it's, it's not. It's an, a question of action. It's a question of action. the prophesized them we have him here and we know where he is and and uh, it's just a great sustenance for this community to have the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, still amongst us here the prophesized him is here we can visit him we can give him salam wherever you are on this planet the the, the prophet said that anybody who says salam alaikum an angel will deliver him that message and in the riwayah it says uh, that يَرُدُّ اللَّهُ إِلَيَّ رُوحِي Allah returns my soul to me فَأَرُدَّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ and so I return the salam to him Imam Asiyyuti said that does not mean that his ruh is coming in and out of his body what it means is that the istighraq that he's in in the presence of his Lord that his consciousness comes back that portion of his consciousness comes back to be aware of that person so he goes from jama' to farq. He goes from the presence of, of the divine presence and unity to the realm of differentiation so that he actually can differentiate. And he also, one of, uh, Al-Banani said, you know, people say, how could the Prophet be giving salam to everybody, uh, you know, individually? Like one person you can only give, and he said, the sun is one source, but its rays are hitting everybody. So, the, I mean, now we have computers with a push of a button, you can send out a, uh, an email to millions of people. <laughs> and like, is a computer less conscious than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I mean, we're only using a small portion of, of, of our, of our in, intelligence and intellect. So, <laughs> People people don't give God his full measure, and they certainly don't give God's creation its full measure. So the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't use your qiyas from this dunya. The akhirah is very different from the dunya, and the abilities in the akhirah are much greater than the abilities in the dunya. But to say, be my intercessor and give sanctuary for this fearful one. This is Shafa'a, the Prophet ﷺ in, in, in Surah Al-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَّا نَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ فَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمَ الرَّسُولُ لَا وَجَدَ اللَّهَ تَوَّبَ رَحِيمًا Had they only, when they wrong themselves, come to you, and ask forgiveness of God, and you ask forgiveness for them, they would have found God merciful and forgiving. That Ayah, there's no differentiation, despite what the, some of the people um, who reject uh, Shafa'a um, have said that it applies to him in life. There's no indication in the verse that it applies only in life. The ayah is mutpaqa. Um, Al-Aini, one of the great uh, scholars amongst the tabi'een, even Kathir relates in his tafsir and makes no inkar of the riwayah. The riwayah is related by Imam al nawi in Al-Adkar, by Qada'iyad in the Shifa, by many of the great scholars. None of them made inkar of the riwayah. When the Bedouin came to the Prophet and uh, Al-Aini said, he stood before the door and he said, Ya Rasulullah, he said, Qalqala Allah Ta'ala, and then he recited that verse, and he said, Faha anada jaytuka mustashfi andika anza rabbi. I have come to you seeking your intercession. And this riwayah is related by all the great ulama, uh, who, 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 uh, who, who, some that I mentioned and many that I have not mentioned. 
they relate it, none of them make inkar of it. And had there been something wrong, had it been shirk, they would have clearly said, Hadi riwaya batila, la asasa laha, you know, none of them did that. Ibn Taymiyyah rejected it, that's fine, but with all respect to Ibn Taymiyyah, these other scholars uh, are, are, are great scholars, and, and that is the dominant opinion of the scholars. So this is what he is in, he's in the, uh, the tradition of the, the, the dominant tradition of the Sunni scholars, of Islam, uh, and uh, the, the the lines that that Arab said are to this day on the prophets. You can see the poems, uh, the, the the lines there are there on the pillars in the wajiha, which I've read many times. Uh, the the uh, the uh, من من دفنت في الأرض أعظمه وقاب من طيبه من الكعب والأكم Oh, best of you whose bones are buried in the earth, and because of you the earth was made pure by uh, your bones. نفسي فداء لقبر أنت ساكنه فيه العفاف وفيه الجود والكرم. My soul is a is a is a fida is a ransom for the 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 tomb that you are uh, in. Uh, in it is. Jude, in it is generosity, in it is, is purity, and uh, and also uh, in the riwayah fi al-ilm wal in it is knowledge and action. So that that is is why he's he's doing that because this is uh, what Muslims have been doing for centuries with uh, and the first to reject it was Ibn Taymiyyah. So it's really a seventh century. Uh, Sheikh Said Ramadan al Bulti said it's a 7th century innovation. That's the opinion of Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya and many, many of the modern scholars that, that have looked at it. If you analyze the two positions, uh, the, the, the position for intercession is so much stronger than the other position. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. That's what my teachers taught me. It's what, uh, um, it's what, uh, adinullah bihi, inshallah. فأنت خير شافع وأعطف وأنت بالأمة منها أرأف فلا تكني وأجرني وأبي والأمة والأهل غدا من نصبي So do not forsake me to myself and grant me sanctuary and for my father, mother and family from all the hardships of that great tomorrow بجاهك الأكرم لذ سيدي ومن يلذ به إلى الرشد هدي بجاهك الأعظم يا خير النبي ما يبلغ الراغب أقصى ما الطبيب وما الطبيب بذابك الغفران والعفو والتوفيق والرضوان والأمن يوم الروع والقبول والفوز بالمحبوب والوصول فيا هناء من قبلتموه ويا عناء من رددتموه حشاء ذا الرحمة والإحسان من أن يرد راجع الغفران فليس للعبد سوى مولاه أدناه فضلا منه أو أقصاه so he says, it is with your rank and stature I seek refuge, my master, whoever seeks refuge through it for guidance uh, is guided by your noble rank, O best of prophets, as long as the desires to achieve their wildest dreams. My object of desire at your door is forgiveness from Allah, clemency, success, and divine pleasure, Radwan of Allah, not to mention security on the day of terror from Allah, as well as an acceptance and victory from the beloved and arrival. Uh, so what joyous congratulations are in order for the one you accept and what calamitous hardships are in store for the one you reject but far be it for one of such mercy and charity to turn away someone hoping for forgiveness from God for the servant in truth has none other than his divine master so now he's making it clear you're a sabab we have none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether he draws him near through bounty or distances him justly uh, فما لنا من الحالتين مذهب عن باب مولانا إلى من نذهب In either of the two cases we have no choice but to go to the door of our master for to whom else can we go يا ربي Oh my Lord God من للحالك الغريق ليس له سواك من رفيقي Oh our Lord Who can help the perishing drowning one for he has none other than you alone as a gentle companion So this is very clear that he's, what he's saying here. The Prophet is a sabab, in reality it's only Allah, which is why even in the dua, Allahumma shafi'u fiya, 
O oh Allah, make him intercede for me, and, and make me also an intercessor for, for, for myself. Make me worthy of being accepted in my prayer, just as he is worthy of that. Ya Rabbi, anqidhu min al-hariqi, so my Lord, save him from the blazing inferno. Bin Mustafa al-hadi ila tariqi by the rank of the chosen one, the one who guides, that baz sababiya, by the sabab of al-Mustafa, on the day of judgment, everybody's going to be forced to recognize his intercession. They'll go to Adam. Why don't they just go straight to God? Go straight to God. They go to Adam. Adam says, nafsi nafsi, I can't do anything for you. They go to Noah, nafsi nafsi. They go to Isa alayhi salam, nafsi nafsi. Every prophet rejects them. This is not their maqam. And then they go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ana laha, ana laha. That's what he said. This is my maqam. And then goes to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, does sajda, does thana ala Allah. Allah Subhanahu irfa, to sal. Raise your head, ask. Shafa, to shafa. Make intercession and intercession is granted. This is the great intercession of, of, of eternity for people, uh, their eternal reality. And that's the one, أَذِنَ لَهُ سُبْحَانَ وَتَعَالَى Allah gives him the permission and he makes intercession. And then when his intercession is done, other people from his ummah get intercession. The martyrs get intercession. The ulama get intercession. The righteous people, people get to intercede. And this is all tashrif. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs no asbab, but this is the sunnah of Allah and his creation. The also on the Yawm Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Qadi la yaqdi bi'ilmihi. The Qadi in Sharia does not judge by his knowledge. If a Qadi is on the way to the mahkama, to his work, and he sees a man murder a man, and then the man's brought to, to his court, he cannot testify in court. The Qadi cannot judge him. He can be a witness, but he cannot judge him. The Qadi is not permitted in Islamic law to judge with his knowledge. He can't do it. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it his sunnah that he will not judge with his knowledge. Allah knows everything, but on Yom Qiyamah, the witnesses come in. Your hands testify. Your feet testify. Your neighbors testify. All those, it's going to be a court of justice. It's not going to be God saying, I know what you did. Now go to hell. No. Everybody's going to come. They're all going to testify. You're going to have your day in court. It's all going to be very clear. What are you going to be begging? Rahma, Rahma. Mercy. You don't want justice. You want mercy. But if you don't want mercy for other people, don't expect mercy from God on the day of judgment. If you don't want mercy for other people, if you want, uh, you know, be just with these people, be just, Ya Allah, be just with these people, give them what they deserve. I hear people saying that all the Allah ya'ti ma yistahak. You know, give him what he deserves. Wait till Yom Qiyamah when Allah gives you what you deserve. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. None of you believe until you want for others what you want for yourself. Well, what do you want for yourself? Just ask yourself that question. What do you want for yourself? You want justice? You can have justice. That's what the world is. It's all people getting what they deserve. Wallahi. It's just a place where everybody's getting what they deserve. Had Allah taken people to account, there wouldn't be one creature walking this earth. So this is, this is the day when the Prophet this is his day. We only sent you as a mercy to all the world. This is the day when that mercy is going to be so manifest to everyone. The mercy of the messenger on that day. And he is the sabab. He is the mushafa. He is the paraclete. The paraclete is the advocate, the intercessor. Greek, the parakletos, the, the, the intercessor. He is the intercessor. He is a mushafa and maqbul. He is the the chosen intercessor. Allah has given him that maqam. And the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu said that the people that deny my intercession will not be given my intercession on Yom Qiyamah. They won't be given it. The people that deny his intercession won't be given his intercession on Yom Qiyamah. Ya Rabbi, lil muqad al kasiri al mufrat al mufarrat al asiri. Oh my Lord, tell me who can this derelict, broken servant, both transgressing and wronged and neglectful and rights, imprisoned by his own desires? That maqam. And the, 
the Prophet ﷺ said that the people that deny my intercession will not be given my intercession on Yom Al-Qiyamah. They won't be given it. The people that deny his intercession won't be given his intercession on Yom Al-Qiyamah. Ya Rabbi, lil muqad al-kasiri, al mufrat al mufarrat al-asiri. Oh my Lord, tell me, who can this derelict, broken servant, both transgressing in wrongs and neglectful in rights, imprisoned by his own desires? Bin mushtaba ajir wa kum mujiri. Oh my Lord, by the rank of the chosen one, set me straight, be my protector. Bi wajhi min lafhat al-sa'iri by his essence protect me from the agonizing flames of fire. Ya Rabbi abdun ja'a mustajira. Oh my Lord, here is a humble servant who has come to you seeking sanctuary. Mustashfi'an bi man'ata bashira and interceding through the one who came with good news. Lahu wa lil-ikhwani wa al-ahlina turran. For his own safety and that of his brother's family, all of them by the rank of Allah, the chosen one, Yasin, bin Abdi Abdillah, wa bin Muzammali, ajid du'ahu mustaghithan wajili, by the rank of Abdullah, the Muzammal, answer the call of this frightened refugee. Bil Hashir al Aqab bin Mudathiri, Ya Rabbi Alini, behold al Kawthari, by the rank of Al Hashir al Aqab al Mudathir, O my Lord, grant me drink at the pool of Al Kawthar, Bi Sahib al Qadibi wa Najibi, Adruka Ya Rabbi Fakum Mujibi, by the rank of the, the one who has the Qadib and the Najib, I'm supplicating, O my Lord, respond to me. Bi Sahib al Mi'raji wa Buraqi, Qina fa'anta Allahu khayru waqi By the rank of the Sahib al-Mi'raj, the Buraq, save me for you are God, the best of those who save. Bi Sahib al-Maqami wal-Liwa'i Anni amirt ya Rabbi kulla da'i By the rank of the Sahib al-Maqam wal-Liwa'i Remove from me every disease, O oh my Lord. Bil Hashimi al Mustafa Muhammadi, Ya Rabbi, wa fiqni wa qawam awadi. By the rank of Al Hashimi al Mustafa Muhammad, O oh my Lord, grant me success and make straight my crookedness. Bi Ahmad al Mukhtari Khayri Mursadi, Ya Rabbi, faghfir li wa aslih amali. By the rank of Ahmad al Mukhtar, the best of messengers, O oh my Lord, forgive me and rectify my actions. Wa bi Nabi al Rahmat al Muqaffa, Ya Rabbi, wa fiqni. By the rank of the Prophet of Mercy, the Muqaffa, O oh my Lord, grant me the grace that I was given, that I was promised. Bi Nabiya Tawbat al Mahi Amhu min Qalbi Siwa Hubbika Hatta Yatma'in. By the rank of the Prophet of Tawbah, Al Mahi, the, the, the remover of, 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 of wrongs and evils, remove from my heart everything other than your love, that it might be contented. By the rank of each and every name among his names, I beseech you, O oh my teacher of these names. So please, my master, do not destroy my hopes that I have in you and my good opinion of you. Answer my plea. Ya rahmatil al-alamina innani bika staghastu lil-ladhi ahammani. Oh, mercy to all the world. Surely I have beseeched and sought aid through you against everything that depresses me. Ya ra'ufan wa rahiman anta min nafsi awla bi fakhudha wa wartahin. O oh, compassionate and merciful one, you are more worthy of my soul than myself, so take it and keep it as a pledge from me. I do not even want to redeem my pledge. O oh, would that one could obtain another's essence. Having said this, I admit my wrongdoing in pledging my soul, it is, as it is not mine to pledge, O oh, possessor of all the essences. So graciously grant this sinner, Sidi Abdul Aziz. Forgiveness, grace, and atonement. And bestow your prayers, O oh my Lord, upon this chosen one. And his family and righteous companions. Finally, the verses of the eyes delight are complete through the aid of the guide, the glorious, the forgiving.
at the outset of the blessed month of his illustrious birth, the most exalted of humanity, our Prophet Muhammad, in Taiba the Radiant, the abode of the Chosen One. Upon him, the prayers in honor of our Lord, wa alihi wa sahbihi, wa man wala, wa man tara minha, minha jahum min al anami muscila, and upon his family and companion, and whoever follows well his path among any of the God's creatures. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad. Allahumma ya Allah a'izz al-Islam al-Muslimin wa a'izz al-Nabiyya al-Kareem. Allahumma a'izz al-Nabiyya al-Kareem ya Allah. A'izz al-Nabiyya al-Arsartahu rahmatan al-Alami ya Allah. اللهم كل من أراد بسمعته سوءا يا الله يا الله خذه يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم يا الله اجعل محبته في قلوبنا وهيبته في 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 أرواحنا يا الله اللهم اجعل هذا النبي الكريم أعز شيء في الدنيا إلينا يا الله اللهم اجعله شفيعا لنا يوم القيامة يا رب العالمين اللهم بارك في أخينا سيدي عبد العزيز اللمطي المنفون هنا في البقية اللهم نور قبره وبارك فيه وكل من خدم هذا الدين وهذا النبي الكريم يا الله اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا في هذه المدينة اللهم والله نعلم أننا أسأنا إليه في هذه المدينة في هذه الأيام يا الله Any sins that we've done in this city forgive us We've been here a long time now and we forget where we are so forgive any wrong actions in this city. Anything that we've done against you. So. Anything that we looked at that we should not have looked at. Anything that we thought that we should not have thought in this place. That you made pure, Ya Allah. Please accept all of our intentions here, Ya Allah. Keep our hearts united, strengthen our religion, take us back to our homes safe and sound, inshallah. Find our family in the best of health, ya Allah. Inshallah, give us love of the Prophet Salih and the ability to follow his deed. Inshallah, ya Allah. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين. So um, and then he says في يوم الاثنين من شهر الأغر في هذا الشهر أو أو الثاني عشر on Monday in the blessed uh, day of Rabi' uh, month of Rabi' al-Awwal the third of the month or the twelfth month you'll get eight nine ten twelve there's different opinions. The dominant and strongest opinion it was on the 12th. And that's what, it's a, it's a national holiday in every single country, Muslim country, with the exception of one. Um, but all the other Muslim countries have it as a national holiday um, to celebrate the Prophet Sallallahu birthday. And historically, it was celebrated with great fanfare throughout the Muslim world. Um, the fact that that the Mawlid has died down so much is, I think, a very bad sign, in fact, in, in the Muslim Ummah. That's my personal opinion. Um, the the Mawlid was an immense time of feeding people, of feeding the poor, of charity, of reading the seerah, of, of reading the shama'il, reciting qasaid, writing poems, delivering poems, visitations. It was a big time because people just felt the blessing of the Prophet, particularly uh, in that month. Um, so, but the Mawlid is celebrated throughout the year uh, by people that celebrate the Mawlid. So it's not that they don't just celebrate it on the Rabi'a Awwal uh, or the 12th, but literally will recite it. It's very beautiful to recite uh, the Mawlid, um, and Barzanji's is certainly probably the best and most authoritative. Imam Rikatani, which is the Moroccan Mawlid, has a beautiful Mawlid also recited in Morocco. 
Um, but it's something that you really want your children exposed to the molded. It's important to celebrate the birthday of the Fulvus Alaiti Sanam. The, the birthday, it, the, the molded, if anybody tells you that it's a bid'ah, well, Surat Maryam is basically a molded because it's, it's relating the story of how Jesus was born. And that's what the Mawlid is doing. It's just you relate the story of how the Prophet ﷺ was born. That's all it is. It's looking at his story and celebrating it, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So, um, and then he said, أَوْلِي ثَمَانِيَ مِنْ رَبِيعَ الْأَوَّلِ مُوَافِقُ النَّيْسَانِ عَنْدَ الْأَوَّلِ So, a weaker opinion holds it was the eighth day of Rabi' al-Awwal, which corresponds to the month of April according to the uh, scholarly premieres. في عام حظ من سنير أسكندري في طالع الجد وكان المشتري مع زحل في وسط السماء تقارنا بالعقرب الغراء So this was around 800 years after Alexander the Great, the sun being in the constellation of Aries. So he was born when the sun was in the constellation. That, that's what they call in astrology a sun sign. Um, he was born when, when the sun was in the constellation of, of Aries. Um, while Jupiter and Saturn were both in the middle of the sky in conjunction with the spectacular constellation Scorpio. So the uh, Jupiter and Saturn were in the, uh, the constellation of Scorpio. Um, these are planets. This canon Mushteri. Okay, we did that. Any other question? Mm hmm. Well, they celebrated his being every day and every, I mean, they didn't have any particular, no, there's no doubt that it was a later innovation in terms of doing it on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, there's no doubt that that, that is a bid'ah to do that. Now, depending on the school, bid'ah is not all bad. And, and that's the dominant school of the ulama is that there are bid'ah hasana. Man sunna fil islam sunnat al hasana, falahu ajrha wa ajrhu man amira biha. Whoever does a good sunnah in Islam, he has a reward for it. The Prophet also said, Man ahdatha fi amrina hada ma laysa minhu, fa huwa rad. The hadith of Aisha that Imam Nawi relates that whoever introduces into the religion what is not from the religion, then it's rejected. So the Mawlid celebration of the Prophet's birthday, for instance, a man asked in the Sahih collection, a man asked the Prophet about fasting on Monday, and he said, Fihi wuridtu. That's his answer. There's a good day. I, it's a blessed day. I was born on that day. We know that in the Sahih collection also that Abu Lahab, his punishment is, is actually lessened because he freed Tuwaiba on, on uh, his, the girl that brought him the news of the Prophet's birthday was freed. Abu Lahab was so happy that his, uh, his uh, brother had a, uh, a, a son that he said, um, you're free, anti hurrah. So he freed the, the girl and the Prophet said because of that, because of his being happy of the Prophet's birthday, which is why, don't say I don't celebrate the birthday, because that's actually, that could be kufa. Just The Prophet said, people will say, Ruba ahadikum yulqi yatakallamu bi karimatan la yulqi laha bala. Maybe one of you will say a word, he doesn't think of what it really means, wa tajurruhu fi jahannama sab'ina kharifa. It will drag him in the hellfire for 70 uh, years. Because he doesn't think of what it means. To, so to say, I don't celebrate the birthday of the Prophet, I would have been done. I mean, what, what do you mean you don't celebrate his birthday? You have to. It's a fault to be happy he was born. If you don't celebrate it on that specific day, as a, like I'm going to, on the 12th of Ribiyat, oh, well, that's fine. That's a khilaf issue. The dominant opinion is it's permissible. Uh, and mandub to do it, it's recommended. The other opinion is that it's an innovation and it's better not to do it, which is, that's a, that's a valid opinion. 
Um, the problem is we accept their differences, they don't accept our differences. So what, what, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. I don't have any, I, I mean personally we celebrate the Maulid. We celebrate it uh, throughout the year though, not just specifically on the 12th. I mean, I, I celebrate it all the time. I read the, this is a maulid right here. I read it all the time. <laughs> so I'm happy every day. Hello, Akbar. Happy birthday, Ya Rasulullah. Wallahi, I'm happy. <laughs> I mean, alhamdulillah. I'm happy he was born every day of my life. Wallahi, I'm really happy. I don't, I don't need the 12th of Rabi'al Awwal to be happy about it, but when the 12th is there, it's really nice too, so it's all good. <laughs> he died in the mid-morning time on the same day he was born, so he died on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, it's the time he made, uh, he made Hijrah at the beginning of Rabi' al-Awwal, but he arrived in Medina on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, so the, that day is a very blessed day, there's no doubt about it. Um, the the uh, the the uh, Imam Al Wan Sharisi has a fatwa in the Mi'yar that it's it it is by far the greatest day, even more than the Laylat Al Qadr. But that mo most of the ulama say tawakkuf on that one. That don't you know? But there there are many ulama that wrote fatwas in the book of Tawqeet that I studied uh, of Ibn Abi Maqra, which is the Moroccan book of orology the sacred science of timekeeping, like learning how to tell the, the uh, shadows and, and uh, the, the days of the year, the star rising, so that you can keep calendrical sacred time. He, he just states that it's like ijma, that there's no khilaf about it, that the day he was born is the best day uh, in, in ever in the history of uh, the world. So that... that uh, uh, that, that, that's how it's presented in, in, uh, in those, you know, medieval texts, the later texts. In the early period, I think, uh, I, I haven't seen any of that, but that's, that's what the later scholars uh, make mention of. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but there's no doubt it's a blessed day. And then, Zaydun Aslamu Safinatun. Safina is an amazing. Uh, person. Safina, whose name means ship, actually in a hadith Al-Hakim relates, and it's a sound hadith according to Imam Al-Hakim. Safina uh, was in a shipwreck, and he ended up, uh, he, he, he got to shore on a piece of a plank from the boat, and he was completely lost. And he went into this ghaba, like a forest, and um, this lion came. And Safina relates this himself. A lion came, and Safina, you know, and the lion, he said, started growling at him like he was hungry. And Safina said, Ya Asad, you know, O oh lion, Ana Safina to Mawla Rasulillah. I'm Safina, the... And he said, at that point, the lion started wagging his tail. And, and then he said, you know, he, he came up and he nudged him and he would move left and right and he showed him the way to the, to the road. That Safina reports that himself. It's one of the miracles of Karamat al-Awliya. وَثْبِتَنْ لِلْأَوْلِيَا الْكَرَامَةِ وَمَنْ نَفَاهُ فَمْبِذَنْ كَلَامَةِ Imam al-Aqani says, believe in the awliya, the karamat al-Awliya and whoever negates them, uh, negate them. So, uh, and then he also, Safina, uh, said that when, when the lion took him to the road, he said, Hamhama, uh, ka'anhu yuwadda'uni. He started going, mm, mm, as if he was saying goodbye to me. And then he left. Now, there's also a riwaya thabita that Muawiyah confirmed when Uqba bin Nafi' went to uh, Qayrawan in Tunisia, they needed the wood for the, to build his... Qayrawan is a qafira tahmulu uh, silah in Arabic. In the Arabic language, caravan is a, a, a qafira is actually on its way back. 
But Qayrawan is a, a caravan, is a, a, a qafila, is a caravan that's carrying weapons. And that's what he named his capital. But he needed wood, so he went to a forest. This is Aqba, the same man who is famous in Morocco for going into the water in southern Morocco. He went into the Pacific and he said, Allah, bear witness that if I knew there were people beyond this ocean, meaning Native Americans, he didn't know that there were, but uh, they were there. Um, he said, if I knew there were people beyond this ocean, I would build ships to carry across the ocean to take this message. But Uqba actually asked the animals to leave. He, he said, we need this forest uh, for houses for the Muslims, and so we're asking you to leave. And they said for three days they saw all the animals leaving the forest, literally leaving to go live somewhere else. Muawiyah, when he heard that, he wanted eyewitnesses to hear that. And so that is considered one of the mutawatir karamat of the tabi'een. It's an amazing uh, narration. So Muawiyah affirmed that. He also affirmed the cow that spoke. Muawiyah was very, you know, these are important things to, to establish. Uh, also Abu Ala al-Hadrami, when he took the soldiers across the the lake with the horses in pursuit of some people. He just said, Bismillah, wamdu fi sabirillah, say Bismillah and follow me. And he went off and they saw the horse go across the water without sinking. These were confirmed karamat of these people. Now some people say, you know, why don't these things happen anymore? <laughs> well, look at us. <laughs> that's all you need to, that's the only answer you need. Trust me, the Christians, their message spread by healing. If you study the early Christians, they, many, and those are mutawatir. They would come to places, people would have leprosy, they would just do laying on the hands, and people would be healed. Many, many people, so that's how it spread. So, karamat are the way religions initially spread, because it convinces people. Once it's established, the karamat are not as necessary. But there's still karamat uh, amongst the awliya, and and uh, you know, alhamdulillah, the the the, the people of Allah, there the, there's karamat. I mean, I've seen from some of my teachers amazing things. More there's kash, what's called kash, which is an unveiling. I mean, I saw unveilings from Murat al-Hajj on more than one occasion, clear, undeniable for me. Um, and other people. There's a man in in uh, in uh, Jeddah right now staying at Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah's house. I and mean, I'll tell you one story. This is a true story because I witnessed it. Uh, his name is Muhammad Yahya Wad Khatti. His son is Yahya. Uh, and and he's the first person that told me about Marat al Hajj. And he told me about his father. And his father is known for this karamat. Very unusual man. But I was in Giru which is a little city near village nearby Kifa, and I'd never been to Kifa before, and they asked me if I wanted to go to Kifa. And I said, you know, there's only one reason I want to go, I'd like to see this man, Yahya al Khatti. And, and they said, no, no, he lives in the desert outside, and we don't have time to go there. And anyway, they convinced me to go just for the trip, just to see Kifa. So I went. Now this was before cell phones, and there was no electricity, none. There were no telephones, nothing. So we got to Kifa, and they had to get some photographs. And we were in the middle of the town, and there was probably about five or six of us. And this man comes up, breaks into our little circle, we were talking, takes my hand and says, Yahsul al-Khair, you know, like, good things happen. And then he said, Salaam Alaikum, and then he just left. And they all started laughing. And I said, well, what was that? They said, that's Muhammad Yahya al Khati. That's the man you wanted to see. So, I mean, I saw that myself. You know. And that's qallun, yani, qabla wabil. I mean, that's just... Uh... So the, these people, there were a lot of miraculous things happened around these people. I mean, Um Ma'bad, when the Prophet ﷺ got to Um Ma'bad, she didn't have any food, and, and the Prophet ﷺ said, do you have anything? She said, wallahi, if I had something, I would feed... She was Bedouin lady. She said, if I had something, I would give it to you. 
She said, we're in bad condition. He, he said, bring the Sha. And she came and she said he touched the Sha and she saw the flesh fill. And then he touched the udder and it filled with milk. And then she said when the Prophet did wudu, the place he did wudu, there's a tree in that area and it's still there, the tree is there. She, Sheikh uh, Abdullah al-Qadi, but it's dry, it's a it's, it's huge tree, it's dry. The, she said a, the tree that grew from the place he did wudu, she said they called it the Mubarakah, the blessed tree. She said nobody ate from the fruit except they were quenched, their thirst and their hunger, and if they were sick they got well. And she said it was beautiful and more green and luscious than any tree that they had seen. And she said one day they woke up and it was dry. And she said she knew the Prophet ﷺ had died. And that was the day that he died. That's a ma'bad. So the miracles of the Christian, the early Christian, they, they were real miracles. I, mean, I read uh, about the, you know, they have in, in Catholicism and Orthodox tradition, it's actually a condition for beatification that your body doesn't corrupt, which we believe that also, the, the, that bodies don't. La ta'akulu al ardu ajsad al awliya. The earth does not eat the, the bodies of the, the real saints, sanctified beings. I mean, there's awliya that are good people, sadihun, but the sanctified beings, people in a state of sanctification, the earth doesn't eat their. their uh, and the habit of Qur'an, it doesn't, but it's not half of like somebody that just can recite the Qur'an from beginning to end. It's the one that lives the Qur'an. Because the real meaning of hafiz is not just to know the letters, but to actually yahmal al-Qur'an. He's hamal al-Qur'an. It lives by it. So, the, uh, but they, they did a study of the bodies in the Vatican, because in the catacombs they have all these bodies that are in a state of complete preservation. And this was, Discovery Magazine did an article on this because they allowed the scientists to go in. Some of these bodies were, um, had been mummified through, you know, the, the process of the tahnil, the Arabs call it. The, uh, and those were often the popes would do that just to, like a little insurance policy. So hoping they'd get sanctification just in case they were going to rot. They had them mummify them. But, but they, there were several that, and one of them was a pre-Islamic, she's a patron saint, a prostitute. She was a prostitute that made toba, pre-Islamic lady. The, one of the scientists said, it was, I was in awe to look at this woman in perfect preservation. And he said, you know, they explain it by the moisture and it, they're in these catacombs and it preserves the body. That's how, but that's real. Here, many times. The grave diggers here, when they dig the thing, they find bodies in perfect uh, thing. I know Sheikh Mahmoud al-Sawaf, one of the scholars from Iraq, who came and and during the the uh, the flood where Sayyidina Hamza's body was exposed, he saw, and I heard this eyewitness, and this is a man I have no reason to doubt his veracity because he he's one of the ulama. He was in Medina and brought in to rebury the body of Hamza and he saw the body was undefiled and uh, uncorrupted. Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu So, and also the musk scent that comes out of many of the graves, I've smelt it in, in several different places, That's, it's real. So the, these are all signs um, for people that are open to them. If you're not open to them, Allah veils you from them. As simple as that. You have to be open to the unseen to experience the unseen. There's people that, there's people that, I mean, I, every time we, we've gone to Maimona, people come to me, is that scent? Does somebody put that there? I was like, no. Every time I've gone there, it's there. So what, somebody's going to go there and dump things? And it doesn't come, it comes only after Maghrib. It's not in the daytime, it's only in the nighttime. So, uh, the same with the c cave of the Prophet I mean, If you go into the cave, anybody that's ever been there, whew, the, the, the scent that you get when you first go in is just, and, and it's, it's been recorded in books for centuries. I mean, somebody's, some perfumer's making a lot of money, I guess, you know. <laughs> go up there every night. <laughs> 
So we, it's good to believe in the karamat and not to deny them. Now, uh, the other thing is to visit Ziyara. Ziyara, Ziyara to Salihin. Visiting righteous people. Now, the Salih, the Salih, you have maratib uh, with Allah. The highest is the Nibi, Rasul. And then the second is Siddiq. The third is Shaheed. And the fourth is Salih. Now, really, they're all Salih. Right? They're all Salih. A Shaheed has to be a Salih. The Siddiq has to be a Salih. And the Anbiya are all Salihin in their nature. Saluha in Arabic means to be uh, sound. And this is related to Salama. Right? Soundness, wholeness. The one who has a Qalb Salim. So Salih is somebody who's sound, healthy. They're not diseased. So their heart isn't diseased like other people's. A salih is the one, the definition of a salih. You eddi haq Allah, or you eddi haq al-ibad. That's the salih. He gives what's due to Allah, and he gives what's due to the slaves of Allah. That's a salih. So when you see somebody who's a, he has taqwa, that's what's due to Allah, taqwa. Do what he commands you to do, avoid what he prohibited you from doing. That's, that's haq Allah. Haq al-ibad are any of those responsibilities that you have in the world, toward other uh, people. So the salih cannot cheat. He, that's fasiq. Because the opposite of salih is a fasiq or a falih. Right? So the salih doesn't lie. He doesn't cheat. Because haq al-ibad would be truthful to them. That's a haq of people. Right? They have a right to be told the truth. You can't lie to them. So the salih is somebody should be visited. Now, the, most of the ulama not only encourage visiting the salihin who are alive, but also the salihin who are dead. And that means that if you're, for instance, in Medina, you go to Baqiyah, and you visit the, the, the salihin of Baqiyah, and you, and you give them salam, and tarahma alayhim. And the Prophet ﷺ used to visit uh, Sayyidina Hamza, and he visited the, the, the maqbara, and he said, Kuntu anhakum an ziyara fazuruha. I used to tell you don't visit graves because of the what the Jahidi Arabs used to do with the graves. But once they were purified of all that Jahidiyyah, they were given permission by the Prophet to visit the graves. Uh -huh. you, you should make dua for them, you know, and, uh, and ask to uh, benefit from their knowledge. One of the uh, Ahmed Baba Timbuktu, who's a great scholar from uh, Timbuktu, who was actually taken as a slave to Morocco. And, and when he got to Morocco, uh, he, was, he was so much more learned than any of the scholars in Marrakesh that they realized that they'd made a grave mistake. Um, but he mentions in his book, he wrote a book, Dibaj uh, al-Mudahab. He did a uh, hashia on Ibn Farahun's book of Tabaqat. And he mentions going to several of the graves of the righteous in Marrakesh and the, one of, at one of the graves, he asked that Allah give him understanding of two books that he wrote. And he said that by Allah, he, he went back and the books, he could read them without any difficulty. And he was a great scholar. So um, that, that was traditionally, uh, you know, to ask for the benefits uh, of their knowledge because most of the, those people were, were scholars and things like that. And Tarahum, that Allah give them nur in their grave and bless them. Abu Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi, who's just outside of Fez, and gave fatwa of visiting the graves of the Salihin. And same with Ibn al-Hajj. And if people say that it's a bid'ah, that's just, you know, it's not consistent with the vast majority of our scholars. The vast majority of them have not only uh, uh, permitted it, but recommended it. And, uh, and those are outward scholars, you know, fiqh that are well known in the tradition. So Abu Abu Bakr 
his grave is well known outside of Fez. He was poisoned uh, by the Muahideen and died there as Shaheed. And he also fought jihad several times. He wrote two commentaries on the Quran. Uh, he fought the Ihya Ulum al-Din from Imam al-Ghazali. He studied with him the Ihya and actually brought it to uh, Morocco uh, and Andalusia. And just a great scholar there. And anybody who's been to that place, you know, you, there, there's just there's a lot of barakah there, inshallah. So, and, but the living, the people who are living, if you have an opportunity to visit them, and also, if, if you should have high himma. In, in, in other words, you should desire to be one so that our ummah has people that you can visit. <laughs> right? We need these people. So, you know, you should make the intention to be one yourself, inshallah, and that Allah give you tawfiq and give all of us tawfiq to do that. Um, one of the poets, he said, إِذَا مَا عَلَى الْمَرْءُ إِذَا مَا عَلَى الْمَرْءُ رَامَ الْعُلَى If a man does not gain height, if he has not achieved height, at least he aspires to height. وَمَنْ يَقْنَعُ وَمَنْ يَقْنَعُ بِالدُّونِ كَانَ دُونَ and whoever is content with less than height, he's less than height. In other words, that's, that's an indication that he's, he's, he's a, a lowly person, that he doesn't even aspire to height. And the greatest aspiration is to be close to Allah. Yeah. So if, you have, if you're in the dunya, have a high himma. And Sidi ibn Atayla said, if you don't think Allah can take you in this moment and make you one of his awliya, then you don't know anything about his qudra. So you should never have despair, have yaas. You should want to be from the people of Wilaya and the people who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ziyara is important. If you're able to visit these people, you visit them. And when you visit them, uh, one, uh, the people of, of this who, who I visited, they don't chit chat. They're not people that you go to, you know, how are you doing and how. You go for the benefit of, of learning something and also the benefit of their dua. And you, you should ask them for their dua because their dua might be accepted. And if it is, then you get the benefit of that. So you visit them, you ask them for the dua, and you show humility uh, with them, humbleness. Don't be arrogant. Uh, and I'll tell you something about Mullah Ramadan, who was from the Salihin. And he was the father of Sheikh uh, Saeed Ramadan al -Buti. And I... Sheikh Said wrote a book, Hada Wadidi, this is my father, and he's told about what a great man his father was. But I want to ask uh, Dr. Bukhar, who's a Libyan, about him, and he told me, uh, and you can confirm this, he's in New Jersey, I think. Uh, he told me, I asked him, he said he met Munda Ramadan, and I wanted to know, because it's always good to hear stories of these people, because it strengthens your iman. And he told me, subhanAllah, the amazing thing about visiting that man, he said, I've always hated kissing hands. And he said, and uh, he said, just something, I never really bothered me, that whole idea of kissing people's hands. And he said, I went in there, and he said, he put out his hand, and he said, I felt pressure on my head. And I, I went down, and I found myself kissing his hand. And he said, I looked back, and there was nothing there. And he just said that he was compelled to kiss his hand. You know, and he, he was a man of Allah. Sheikh, Sheikh Mullah Ramadan. He really was. He was a man of Allah. So those people, they're, they're worth visiting. And fortunately, they still exist. You know, you can find them in... Uh, uh, and there's there's some women that, like, I've met. Murat Sahib's wife, Maryam, is definitely, I consider her from the Salihat, Suzar. And uh, even their servant, Gabula, um, people go, when they visit Murat Sahib, they visit his wife, and then they go visit the servant. Gabula and after they go after them. And uh, there's a woman there, Aisha bin Minni also, who's a very righteous woman and a scholar. She's an alima. Uh, Fatima bin Nofal, who's in, uh, 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 who's in uh, Dar al Bayda. And there's good people, alhamdulillah. So uh, if you get an opportunity, you visit them. And with that, atiqad, you know, and Allah knows their station. We're only, it's a belief, and we can't, like when we were looking at the Sira earlier, about uh, Khawla, the wife of um, of uh, uh, Uthman ibn Mad'un, when she said, you know, he, he's in Jannah, the Prophet got angry. So we don't say they're awliya uh, with jazam. We believe that they're people of wilayah. But we can't say he's a wali and make a halaf and, 
والله إنه لا والي وإن لم يكن والي فأنا أدون كذا. That that's up to Allah. But we were commanded to uh, observe the outward. And then he says, "Salli ala nabi pray on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam." So prayer on the Prophet ala nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now the thing about prayer on the Prophet, and really this is one of the greatest things about it. There are many. The benefits of prayer on the Prophet. Some of them they wrote books just on that benefit. I've seen one book that had about 60 benefits of prayer on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned. One of them was that your passing the sirat is made easy because the prayer on the Prophet will come on the Yom Al-Qiyam when you have to pass across the bridge to the other side and it will help you across the hadith. It draws you closer to the Prophet Sallallahu One of the things about prayer on the Prophet is the more you do it, you will be forced to love the Prophet Sallallahu in other words, love will enter into your heart merely by the prayer. It's one of the benefits of the prayer. You increase in love and yearning for the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It purifies the heart. It's considered a shaykh when there's no shaykh, and this is well known. The Ahmad Zarruq said, "When there's no shaykh, prayer on the Prophet purifies the heart." So, doing a lot of prayer on the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah wa malaikati yusalloon ala nabi. Both Allah and He second it with His angels do salah ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal nabina amnu sallu alayhi wa sallimu tasneena. Pray on Him and do tasneen. So this is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a qur to pray on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At least, according to the Madakis, at least once in your life. According to the Imam Shah, you have to pray every prayer. In the Malik, in the Mustahab, in the Shafi, in the Mustahab, is the Wajib. وَقَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّرَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ الصَّرَاةُ عَلَيَّ نُورٌ فِي الْقَلْبِ وَنُورٌ فِي الْقَبَرِ وَنُورٌ عَلَى الصِّرَاةُ وَهِيَ أَمْحَقُ لِلْذُنُوبِ مِنَ الْمَاءِ الْبَارِ لِلْنَارِ And that's one of the few hadiths that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq relates. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, if you look in the books of the hadith, he rarely relates any hadith. And that was related from him. That prayer on the Prophet ﷺ, prayer upon me, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, is light in the heart. It's nurun fil qalb. It's nurun fil qabr. It's light in the grave. Wa nurun ala sirat. It's light on the on the, the sirat, which is what you go across to get to paradise and, and the hellfire is under. And it is greater in its extinguishing wrong actions than cold water is for fire. And then Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. This is a very short uh, uh, dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a prayer on him. And we know in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Jibreel gave him bishra, that man salla alayya wahida sallallahu alayhi ashra. Whoever says uh, prayer on the Prophet one time, Allah says prayer on him, which is rahmah. Right? Allah gives his rahmah on him ten times. So he's saying to that ten times, which would be the equivalent of a hundred times of Allah's rahmah upon you. Uh, and it's, it's preferable you should at least try to do prayer on the Prophet a hundred times in the morning, a hundred times in the evening. Uh, and uh, Shaykh Rahman ben for a bit, long period of his life did it five thousand times a day uh, as a practice. Uh, and and, and Sayyidina you know, Jazuli, he used to do, uh, for 14 years, he did the Alam Harat twice a day and Khatam al Quran once a day. And 114,000 times, Bismillah rahman rahim every day. He did that for 14 years. And he said when he came out of his khaya, people made terrible just by seeing him. <laughs> He lived in Fas at Madras of Safarun for the people that were there. He was there, that was his room. And in fact, he was in that room so long, and he memorized one of the uh, really difficult books of uh, Madaki Fiqh there, which is several volumes. He memorized it by heart. He's a great Madaki scholar as well. He's a fakir. But he, uh, 
They, they, they were saying that he had a treasure up there that he was hiding. You know, people talk and they think, why is he up there? And he never leaves. He must have some gold up there that he doesn't want anybody to get. And so they went to his father to convince him to go up there because he wouldn't let anybody come up. And there was a ladder to get to it. So his father came out to come up. He let him out. And when he came up, he had written moat, which means death, all over the walls. <laughs> and there was nothing in the room. And he just, he said he realized, his father said he realized some people are not valid and other people are not valid. You know, he was just in a completely other world. <laughs> so, Allah commanded us to do that. Right? He began with himself and then he said the angels. And then also, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, when the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ya Rasulullah, how much of my dhikr should I make prayer on you? And, and he said, a fourth. And he said, that's good, and if you increase, it's better. He said, half. He said, that's good, and if you increase, it's better. He said, three, four, that's good, if you increase, it's better. And then he said, I'm going to make all my uh, uh, dhikr prayer on you. And the Prophet said, if you did that, it's good. Uh, Imam al-Jazuli took permission from that for people that feel compelled to, that that becomes their devotional practice, that they do prayer on the Prophet And there are people that do that. That's all they do. And if you and I've met some of those people, and they, they're amazing people. They really are. They're always happy. They always smile. And they're really nice to be around. And I guarantee that is a quality of people that do a lot of prayer on the Prophet Sallallahu They're happy. They're not miserable people. So there's a great light in prayer on the Prophet. There's a great blessing. And uh, and it shouldn't be underestimated. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, if you don't have a murabbi, then the prayer acts as a murabbi. In other words, it prayer on the Prophet will purify your nafs. So just doing prayer on the Prophet, and he recommends at least 500 times a day. Um, Shaykh Uthman Tanfodio, he used to do 5,000 a day, and he did that for several years. Uh, and he saw the Prophet Sallallahu in visions many, many times. Um, Imam Madik Radhi was always doing prayer on the Prophet. The Muhaddithun are famous for that, because every time they would recite a hadith, write a hadith, they would pray on the Prophet Sallallahu and Imam Madik said that he never uh, slept ever a night except that he saw the Prophet <laughs> So there's a great blessing in it. People show that. And then another thing is tilawat al Quran. The fourth thing is recitation of Quran, and preferably with the dabbur. Reciting with the dabbur awakens up the heart. It's one of the lessons have effect. And so you pray on the Prophet ﷺ because prayer on the Prophet acts as a murabbi uh, for the heart itself and purification of the heart. Which is why the, also most of the later ulama all encourage those two specifically because of the wrong actions that so many of us uh, are engaged in, but also because by ijma of the ummah, the only record of that's absolutely guaranteed to be accepted by Allah is Salah al nabi Anybody, anybody who says Allah was Sri Allah Sayyidina Muhammad, it's maqbul. <laughs> So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded a command that he himself began with, which you don't see that anywhere else in all the things Allah has commanded us to do. He doesn't begin with it except pray on the messenger of Allah. So he, Allah himself, said, in Allah, and then he seconded it with the They do this. And then Allah said, Ya Allah, Sallu alayhi wa sallam wa taslima. Pray on the Messenger of Allah and do Tasleem Allah wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa sallam. So 
So he had a prayer on the Prophet ﷺ one time, Allah prays on him ten times according to the Sahih Hadith, and he said, whoever Allah prays on ten times, what else do they need in this world than the next? So, just pray on the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet of Islam said that prayer upon the message of Allah is light uh, in this way, light in the grave and then light on the Sarat. So in other words, it will give you light, guidance. In, in when you need it, or so give it in the grave, it'll make your grave light instead of dark, and then it'll make the set up light so you can see to get across it. Light in the heart. So he said, no, no one else we've been commanded to pray on the Prophet of Allah. And therefore, when you pray on the Prophet, and that's why usually it's good to begin with the actual ayah, because by beginning with the ayah, then you're actually, it's called intifad amrillah. You're in fulfilling the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you, if you have to do it as a wajib at least once in your life to fulfill that command. But you can do it every single time that you do the prayer on the Prophet. <laughs> And so the uh, the really prayers on the Prophet Islam, he should have the same adab that we he have if he is remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it's uh, mandir for him to be in wudu. It's mandir for him to be facing the qibla. It's mandir for him uh, so those things that are mandir for prayer are mandir for prayer on the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also istihbar, and so what he said. And then that you have istihbar of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you pray as if you were in his presence. You should, uh, in the same way that when you pray to Allah, you pray as if you're in the presence of Allah, kamika tarawzin min tukum tarawzin min yarak, that's ihsan. With the prayer on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you should pray as if you are in the presence of, uh, of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are courtesies of the prayer, the adab. What you, what you do when you do the prayer in the Prophet of Allah, say, like you're going to pray, it's, these are going to do that adab that you should do. Tahara, siya, cleaning the mouth, uh, perfume, things like that. They're all good things to do. And when you have extreme uh, actions, you will have re extreme responses. This is the nature of the world. So, extremism is a problem. Beware of extremism in the religion. The Prophet warned us. And so, and I've seen people go into psychotic states from doing, doing too much dhikr. I've seen this. I guarantee you. I've seen this with my own eyes. People that go into psychotic states from doing too much dhikr. Dhikr, there's over-the-counter dhikr, 
and there's prescription Vico. I'm not, I really mean that. There's over the counter, you can take Tylenol uh, Vico, you know, get rid of headaches, all that stuff, that's fine. But if you want to take hydrocortisone Vico, you know, you're going to end up blowing out your kidneys. So it's really important to, to know this. There's people that start doing, uh, you know, certain Asma Allah al-Husna obsessively over and over again, and, and you know, you can really harm yourself. The, the, the ikthar min al is something that it's a good thing, but generally, subhanAllah, there's certain dhikrs that are cooling, there's certain dhikrs that are heating. These are all sciences that the Muslims have known for a long, long time. I mean, there's a science of the letters, the huruf themselves. You know, the letters that are involved in the names, the divine names, have powers. So it's, it's just very important for people to know that. The best thing that you can do is istighfar and salah ala nabi La ilaha illallah, abdurru ma qutu ana wa nabiyuna min qabli, la ilaha illallah. Did you do imanikum, imanikum bi qawlikum, la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is a good thing to do. Astaghfirullah is a good thing to do. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Prayer on the Prophet will never hurt you. It will never hurt you. Prayer on the Prophet will always be a benefit. There's can't go wrong with that. But people, you know, s start doing ya fatah, ya fatah, ya fatah, and do uh, large numbers of things like that. You know, you, you, you can, so you just, you have to be careful with all, religion to me is, it's a double-edged sword, it's very dangerous, there's a lot of religious illness. People just aren't well, religiously. You know, and I think you got a glimpse of it at Uhud today, you know, people, I mean, these are, these are places where there should be sakina, tranquility. So when you see agitation, uh, the ego is present. You know, when people become uh, agitated in these places, then it's, you know, it's, it's all just the uh, presence of ego. But it doesn't tell you how you develop khushua, because it's not the, uh, the object of fiqh. It's not one of the topics of fiqh. That is in tasawwuf. And that's the word that was used by the Muslims historically, is tasawwuf. So those people that deny tasawwuf are the same type of people that deny madhabs and that deny, uh, you know, tawheed, ilm al-karam. This is the same uh, type of people. And it's very unfortunate, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, this has happened, but it's, it's one of the unfortunate aspects of, of uh, the modern phenomenon of, uh, of Islam. That the Prophet said the end of time will not come until the later people condemn the earlier people. So the Prophet mentioned that. That people are going to, the later people are going to condemn the earlier people. So, um, but that's also, it's important to point out that there's a lot of innovations in what goes under the category of tasawwuf. So it doesn't mean tasawwuf, every, we just accept anybody who says they're a Sufi and we accept anything that calls itself tasawwuf. No, tasawwuf is based on the book and the sunnah. And if you don't find a firm foundation in the book and the sunnah, it's rejected. And that's what the imams of tasawwuf said. Imam Junaid said, هذا العلم قيد بكتاب الله وسنة رسول الله. This is a science that is absolutely uh, rooted in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet. And so if you don't find it in the book of Allah, Imam Tasturi, uh, Sahar Tasturi said uh, that, or that in me, one, one of them said that, uh, he said, ما سمعت كلمة من القوم إلا عرضتها على شاهدين عادلين كتاب الله وسنة رسول الله. That I never heard anything from the Sufis except that I put it before a two just witnesses to testify for or against it. And that's the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet So that is the, the way of tasawwuf, and that's what he's saying. Those are the people that are rightly guided, not the false ones, not the, uh, I mean, you have the skewer people and the snake handlers, just like in Christianity, you have the people that take literally the handling of snakes or speaking in tongues and things like that. You, you, you have those manifestations of religion in every tradition, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a scholastic tradition that also relates to practice and experience. The, the second aspect of tasawwuf 
is the science of ahwal and maqamat, the science of states and stations. Because if you're on a strong spiritual path, if you're doing a lot of dhikr and meditation, getting up at night, things start happening. And some of it, there's, there's ways to distinguish between inward sensory uh, terrestrial, inward sensory uh, celestial, uh, inward meaning terrestrial, inward meaning celestial, uh, outward uh, t uh, terrestrial, outward celestial, outward meaning terrestrial, outward meaning celestial, outward meaning uh, terrestrial, inward, uh, outward uh, terrestrial uh, sensory. I mean, those are all categories in that science and they look at things so people will have what they think is a spiritual experience and it's not it's just your ego 